So this is the first episode of our discussion of, here we run into the first problem, I don't know how to pronounce the surname, uh, Peter Gerdenfors. Yeah, um, me neither. Whatever. Yeah. Peter Gerdenfors's book, Conceptual Spaces, The Geometry of Thought. Yeah, maybe if I, I'll just start straight with the co-reader. I still don't know how to call the person. I think co-reader isn't a word, but the co-reader of this book. Again, I'm joined by Kun Forlis. Who Hello. Already was there for the Killing Floor book club and distinguished himself through uh, questionable Google searches and <laughs> in the name of the podcast. Um, <laughs> and uh, also relived some childhood experiences on the podcast. Yeah. So it was a very eventful episode or like series. E emotions and, and, and everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether I have that this time uh, because it's a very not. different kind of book. Today we will be discussing the first two chapters. Usually I did a kind of summary so far always of the chapters, but that doesn't really make sense now if we just have two chapters, um, other than maybe to say chapter one is a kind of introduction overview of the entire book mm -hmm. um, and kind of prepares you for what's to come. And then chapter two compares the, uh, I'm not actually sure how do you, does he call it the three levels of representation or the three types of representation? Here um, in the preface he has the, Three kinds of representation. Kinds, That's, yeah. So yeah. the three kinds, symbolic, conceptual, and subconceptual representation. Yeah, and th those are the two chapters we'll be talking about today. Uh, I thought maybe it might be interesting to start by saying, like, why we're reading this. Because I guess it's not, compared to the other books I've read so far on the podcast, which were Crime and Punishment, Killing Floor, and The Invention of Nature, the kind of Humboldt biography. This one is a much more niche book. And... I don't think most people have even heard of this. <laughs> it's in the, it's uh, like, been in my wish list, my Amazon wish list, or whatever, or like you know, just my my yeah, yeah. Uh, thing for safe like later, a year. Whatever. Yeah, safe later. because yeah. she, surely of like of the title, right? Like the conceptual spaces. So, but I'm assuming also that uh, it was the same for you as for me, which is that I read Jakob Belmont's review paper in Science, mm -hmm. where Peter Ganfoss was one of the authors, and they cite the book in there, and that, and that's the first time I really heard of this guy. And I, or was it different for you? Or yeah, I have to like I I wasn't aware of that 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 he was on that paper. Um, oh, okay, no, uh, I think it's, oh, I okay. think Jakob uh, collected a good selection of co-authors with yeah, it <laughs> Peter like Gerden first, Edvard Morza, and um, Christian Dela. He did well, yeah, damn. Yeah, and no, that's so that's the the first time I heard about him, just because uh, I was interested in the whole abstract cognitive maps topic mm -hmm. and yeah peter genfers was one of the co-authors and they cited this book in there and then i Got thought it. this kind of sounds interesting and mm -hmm. here we are here we are i mean but i guess wait, sorry you didn't on. hear about this from the paper or no no i just, just like did amazon just know that you would like this or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think the the Amazon AI is is pretty well trained on me. Um, I've got a big wish list of books on Amazon. No, I mean, and I, you know, and then you read see, read some reviews, look on Goodreads or whatever, and I'm like, ah, oh, that sounds kind of interesting, right? Yeah, you know, they completely passed me. Um, I'll, I'll have another look at the okay. paper because I did look him up, Peter Gan, for because I was like, oh, he must be cited in like the RSA paper, the the initial one, uh, mm -hmm. but he isn't, so. But I guess we can talk okay. about it a little bit more later. I mean, one thing that I found interesting is that this also just barely overlaps in terms of citations with the whole spatial navigation field, which is weird to me. Yeah. I mean, maybe for, for slight context. So I guess I have an entire episode with Jakob Belmont on this, but or half an episode on this, of how this applies to spatial navigation. But I guess the general idea is just that, for those who don't know, there's this whole research area in neuroscience about spatial navigations. Navigations navigation and basically where they found cells that represent where you are in space and a kind of metric that helps you move through space and that kind of research in the last let's say roughly five to ten years has been now applied to kind of more abstract things so where the two dimensions of space let's say you're moving around in a room in a like square room the the, the two you basically have like two spatial axes in which you're moving and then people started asking, well, what if that, if these axes are not spatial, but anything else, basically? And that's also what Jakob's review paper is about. And that's kind of like the, the from how I got to this mm -hmm. um, and why I find this interesting. But what I found really interesting is that 
first caveat, this book was published in 2000. So this was also published five years before the first grid cell paper. Yeah. But what I still find interesting is that I just flick through the references. John O'Keefe isn't cited once. And Tolman is cited. So okay. there is at least one link to spatial navigation. Yeah. But it was kind of fascinating to me that just the the, the stuff he's talked about in the first two chapters also, mm. just it's completely different, right? Yeah. It, it doesn't overlap with that. And even his, you know, he has the section on how this relates to neuroscience, but it's completely different research, mm. which, yeah, I just found really interesting. And yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, I had a look as well, like at some papers, because it's like, oh, this must be, you know, these papers, you know, the RSA stuff and stuff seem to me like also like to be influenced by this, but you know, it, it wasn't. But even like in his citations, he seems to miss some important, like us, like Mars three levels, for instance, right? Like even as, because that seems such a. I think that that will be in there though. Oh, we'll be in there. Okay. I didn't look, I only. I think he cites Mars. Let me oh, okay. Okay. I can have, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. He does cite. Yeah, okay. Okay. Cites, uh, okay. Then so I'll shut up. That's probably going to, I think that's going to come in there at some point. Okay. Um, but yeah, just just the yeah. As I said, this 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 does precede uh, the huge boost in spatial navigation research that came, especially with the Morses. Um, yeah. But there's no, you know, there's no head direction cells or grid cells or anything like that, uh, play cells or anything like that. Uh, so that was just a slight surprise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So, what did you kind of expect of this book? To be fair, I had, I had very few expectations. I mean, okay. I think I knew that he, I think he's described as a philosopher on his website or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I did expect this to be, well, I mean, it is a theoretical work. That, that's kind of what I expected. I mean, it's also a book, I guess, like back in, I mean, I have read some books in which they present original data, especially like in the 50s. There's some of the game theory books where they present mm -hmm. first results in a book. Cool. Which is always vaguely annoying <laughs> because that's not really why I work. Why I work for? Yeah. yeah so sure. I did expect it to be like in the, uh, in in, yeah. Like if you buy a book now from a philosopher, you expect it to be theoretical, right? Mm -hmm. um, or even a scientific book. You don't really expect new results in there. So that's that's kind of something I expected. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess I because I've read Jakob's paper. They asked that you know there they kind of discuss how you have. How you can, you know, you let's say you just have two axes, and then you you have kind of these these almost stereotypical representatives of certain things. So they, for mm -hmm. example, have like in their paper the two axes are so talking about cars, and they have the weight and the horsepowers, yeah. like the, the power of the car, something like that. And they say, you know, you you basically you this this continuous variables, but at some point. If a car is light enough and strong enough, it becomes like a sports car. Whereas at some point, it becomes like a lorry, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And so you have these kind of prototypical, stereotypical exemplars in there. And then depending on basically, if you have something that's in this 2D space, then whatever stereotype is closest to what you to what you're seeing, you associate it with that. Mm -hmm. So I expect something like that to be in there, but. Yeah, no, I had very few expectations. I mean, okay. what did you think? I also didn't have many, many expectations. I was just kind of curious to to hear what he had to say, because I think representations in general are like a big topic in neuroscience, right? Like how... <laughs> Which is, sorry, I agree. Like, But the funny thing is, I remember that I still don't exactly know what the problem is. It's some of this topic that's completely like gone by me <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> I remember we once had a lab meeting about this this one paper, right? By was it by Paul Drug? I can't remember. Mm, yeah, yeah, the like physics one. of representations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, to be fair, like when I wanted to read that paper, I had like before the lab meeting on the same day, I had this complete mental not mental breakdown, but like my energy just drained me entirely for some reason that I don't think was related to the paper. So I didn't exactly get a lot from that discussion or from reading that paper. Got it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't really know much about representation, which is. Yeah, it seems like everyone thinks it's a super important thing, and I still don't quite understand it. Um, okay, and yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, to me, I think to, one of the questions is just like, you know, how does it happen, right? Or, or, you know, we know it's like neurons firing, and then some kind of way is there, you know, they're combined firing or whatever it is. Or, or yeah, I mean, I don't know much about it, but but makes it into like 
a thing or whatever, right? And yeah, it's very fake. I'm very, very fake now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyways, that's like, Th yeah, that's why you're here. I'm the philosopher here. Um, but what I really, what I hope to get from the book is just a different viewpoint. I think, like, yeah, definitely. You know, like another mental model to add to the list or a way of thinking. Um, and I think that's definitely gonna. I mean, yeah. For me, I guess it's like even just the introduction of these three levels is, I guess, a kind of discussion about these things that I haven't really read about, which feels like I. Sh should have in the sense that like, it would have been very helpful because mm -hmm. i guess like a lot of the, the things i think about and that confuse me are exactly how th these different concepts we read about relate to each other and you know you, for example you have let's say as you mentioned like the, the mars three levels and then you think of something like this and you're like okay but how do they relate to each other like what what mm -hmm. kind of relationship is between these two other competing theories does one fit into the other or yeah and so it was kind of nice to see that by the way, did you uh, did you see uh, the Onion posted something uh, like a week ago or something? No, which was something which is one of the greatest things I've seen, and it was uh, like by them at least, and it was interdisciplinary in in quotes. Linguist brings up Ma. 1982 on first date <laughs> <laughs> and it's, this photo of these like two people on a date <laughs> and then the script is like yeah it's really interesting how like the first level is the computation <laughs> yeah that's so good yeah yeah i'll put that i'll put, I'll put that in the description <laughs> yeah, the podcast, <laughs> along with everything else we talk about um but yeah so now I, every time i hear mal i just have to think think about that <laughs> of yeah that. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, um, very good. Shall yeah, we get as, into as, as chapter one? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, maybe it still has a kind of slight overview of how, what we thought of the first two chapters as we discussed before we started recording. I yes, think we yes. both had a similar kind of idea that I thought chapter one was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really read it and went like this. I mean, and it still might be true. This might be a chapter in my thesis, even though I'm not really doing this. It felt like mm -hmm. suddenly like, oh, this is super cool. I already have vague, but I have several, like, some ideas of what I might want to do with studies with some of these things and how things fit together. I was like really amazed. And then chapter two was a bit of like, yeah, <laughs> slightly boring. Yeah. 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 No, definitely. I, I chapter one, I also like, because I realized like, I don't know, like level, level of difficulty wise. I think this book is right on my level. Like chapter one, yeah. like I have to pay attention, but I can do it kind of, right? Yeah, exactly. It's not that I have to like look up words or look up stuff like con constantly. And then for chapter two, I was like, or chapter one, I was fully focused. Chapter two, I started to like, you know, drift a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. Because it's just a little bit more example comparisons. Yeah. I mean, uh, maybe one, one concern I might have had before is that, you know, philosophers don't necessarily have the best reputation when it comes to accessible writing. And especially in Germany. And I thought this is really simply written. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, sometimes, sure, you maybe drift off a little bit because it's something you don't really care about too much. But um, yeah, I was really surprised how accessibly written this is. Yeah, considering that this is like an academic textbook by a philosopher or philosopher of mind. Sure. Make it even worse. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, anyway. So one thing I guess we're kind of going to somewhat randomly maybe jump around like points we found interesting in the first two chapters mm -hmm. um i mean i guess like i guess we don't really know or slash we have already motivated why we find the overlay of conceptual spaces interesting but one thing i found really interesting and it's one of those things right like once you read it some of those things where you go like oh yeah that's super obvious mm -hmm. and i you might have had the thought before but i never quite put it together that way and that's for example how you know how how the the mental representation of certain sensory modalities doesn't match at all the representation of the actual stimulus that you perceive so yeah. the example he gives and the one that was most interesting to me is the one with color or with yeah. with vision in general where the electromagnetic spectrum you know goes from one end to the other but we perceive it as a circle when it comes yeah. to colors and that was super interesting to me because you know i mean i take photos Although I seem to be saying that more than I actually do it recently. But I take photos and I edit them, right? And I use Adobe Lightroom to edit photos. And the way he describes it here is pretty much exactly the way you edit photos. Or at least you can okay. edit the color stuff in Lightroom. Because you have a pretty much exactly the color circle that it presents here. It looks yeah. pretty much exactly like that. You can then kind of select, you know, then it will increase the the 
how much orange, let's say, there's in it or something. Mm -hmm. So you have the hue kind of when you go around. You have the intensity when you go from the middle to the outside of the circle. Yeah. Um, and then you can change the brightness separately. <laughs> so it's, it's, that's pretty much like one function that you have in photo editing tools. And I even, so that was one part. And the, the other thing I really also thought was really interesting that he mentioned that because it's also very, you know, it's also true when it's also maybe not that surprising, but is that the brightness and the, what does he call it? Chromaticness of light is not independent of each other. I mean, I had this recently, like when I walk home, I walk through this like, uh, there's like this passage where I walk for like 10 minutes, basically through the pitch dark, <laughs> basically. And there's these gardens on each side. Yeah. And, you know, when after about like five minutes, your eyes get used to the darkness quite a lot. And yeah, then you see yeah. quite a lot, but everything is black and white. Oh, really? And yeah, yeah, because because when it's dark, you don't really perceive color that much. Sure. Yeah, 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 and um, it, I find it always interesting that you know black and white is always made to be like an unrealistic kind of, uh, like kind of maybe even random feature that came from black and white photography, yeah. or when you have like uh, shadows or something like that, right? But if you actually go through the dark, it's pretty similar. It, it, it is very much just a grayscale variation when you walk through it. Um, yeah, I guess and. Yeah, that was just really interesting to me, seeing like this stuff that I knew about from taking photos and that kind of stuff. Just seeing that like in this book suddenly appear in the beginning. Go like, yeah. oh yeah, I never put the two together really. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of also what I meant with like these different, you know, giving me new mental models, right? It's just another way of thinking about it. like even, you know, what he said, like time can be, you know, time is a line, right? But then even for some cultures, he said, like, time is like, you know, a circular thing, right? I don't know what well, you think do about it. you know what the cultures are? I, don't, no. I didn't look it up. And I, I forgot to look it up now that I'm talking about it, yeah. Yeah, me so, too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, that, that, that was me a little bit thing. The thing with this book is like, like I kind of write things down for myself to look about, look at later instead of like, because I don't want to get out of it, right? Because I feel yeah, like yeah, if yeah. you get out of it, you have to reread a lot. Um, That's what I don't like about his footnotes. I feel like they don't add much. And then every time I've like, forgotten what yeah. the original sentence was. Yeah, no, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so only some of them are um, are uh, interesting. <laughs> yes, a select few. A select few. But yeah, I guess it's and that that is something where I mean I, you know, I haven't thought a great deal about this slash basically not at all. But I am wondering, like, are there other features, you know, where for some reason humans just mentally transform something into a kind of data structure that it actually isn't once you perceive it or once you yeah. get it originally and I, I mean i haven't been able to think of one like immediately and i haven't thought about it much but it does make me wonder like you know why is for example sound perceived as a line that goes from zero to until your ears burst yeah and but the color is perceived as a circle like yeah yeah no it's very interesting and i and i, I wonder if there's like you, you know i guess it comes in with the representations like what is the best way of like comp computing this or computing mm -hmm. on this, right? You have this representation of color, but what does my brain, like, what does it need to do to parse this information, right? Is there like a circular representation or does my brain transform it to two dimensional space to then do, you know, because we kind of, I guess in, in nowadays we get kind of expect a lot of things to be transformed or in two-dimensional space right if we if we believe like current literature a little bit right with these conceptual we, spaces you mean as scientists as scientists yeah or as, as neuroscientists i guess um, um specifically yeah, but not like as, as a first i thought you meant like as a general person no 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 sorry i like guess as, as neuroscience like kind of like there's this little bit of a hype field about the grid cells right or i mean maybe not a hype but like i guess a lot of people are doing it because and we kind of expect and we see a lot of times that there is this two dimensional representation of like a lot of like abstract things. Right. And I've wondered, and I, and I talk with people about this, like one thing, of course, why we find these two dimensional representation is because that's easy for us to understand. Right. But like, what would a circular as scientists, as human beings? Yeah. Right. We can imagine a two dimensional plane and how things are projected on it. And the, fi the fact that we find that in neurons it doesn't mean there's any other representation. It's just that this is two dimensional. It's really easy to find for us, right? Like as yeah, three dimensional what we're human looking beings. For. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I guess there's always this question: like, are you finding it because it's the way it's done, or just because it's what you're looking for? Yeah, and, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, it makes me wonder too. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I'm just trying to think of the spatial navigation stuff. I mean, I think it does seem as if those were found fairly exploratory by, you know, you put, a, yeah. you put an electrode on a rat or a mouse and let it run around and yeah. then you see wherever it fires. So I think that probably is something that's, it would surprise me if that wasn't actually the way it's coded. You know, I don't think anyone planned and said like, oh yeah, it's probably exadirectional, let's look for that. Sure. But yeah, for most of the other stuff that's following it and is going to follow it. Uh, yeah, that's the question, you know, whenever you make, do a grid cell analysis over something, what, you know, what does that exactly mean? Maybe it does mean that it, the brain codes for it, but I guess even with grid cells, I'm not even sure whether it's clear whether they actually do anything. Yeah. Because I think, I'm not sure, I don't know, there must, someone must have done a causal study about this, but I don't no, actually like, know. I mean, there's like reward cells and stuff like that, right? So that basically fire for No, I mean, what I mean is like mean? with grid cells is that I don't know whether they are actually causally involved or, may, you know, it could be like some sort of artifact that just happens or something or, you know, sure. like whether, again, I, I don't know this field that well, but all I know is that when a rat is there in a certain space, then a neuron fires. But like what exactly that means, I'm not even sure. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, you know, does it use that information or does it? Yeah. 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 Is this or, doing you know, what whatever. is this doing? Yeah. Yeah. What's or the information kind of process? Some or... weird phenomenon that uh -huh. just happens and doesn't really matter much. Yeah. Yeah. Someone must have done a causal like manipulation there. But... <laughs> yeah, there was this talk with Tim Barons, but I couldn't understand. They did some kind of simulations where they were like, oh, this is, you know, yeah, but, I, but the thing is, I couldn't hear the author name that he mentioned, and I never uh, found yeah, a paper. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so you'll just never know. You'll never know because, you know, there's no way of finding this out. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, what what I so what I like about this, what I like about the first chapter is that he basically breaks it down, you, you know, like representations, right? He breaks it down, like, and he talks about um, um, topographic maps that we find in the in the cortex a lot, right? Um, retinotopy, tonotopy, and somatotopy. <laughs> one of <laughs> one like like, I'll just like yeah, I'll just say yes, yes. Okay. that's what it's called. Thank you. What it basically means Definitely. is that there's like a coding, like where. Um, similar items in like in visual space or on on your body or in tones are also like next to each other in the in the brain right in the cortex and he kind of uses that right i think in chapter two he talks about um um tonotopy right as it that it's actually a line i guess we talked about this a little bit already yeah i'm sorry i mean like one thing i do find interesting and maybe this is also just some like the kind of math that I like is this kind of ge geometric stuff and topological stuff where, you know, you, you can talk like, okay, so you can be in, you know, I mean, like, yeah, you can be like in Euclidean space and then these kind of things are the case, or you can be in topological space or like as in like a network or whatever, right? And then you have all these other different rules. And I just found it really interesting to see like, you know, these, these, both of those are used widely in neuroscience right mm -hmm. i mean this is super common um for lots and lots of stuff but i don't know for me again like i think one of the reasons why i found this so interesting and why i Im immediately felt like this might be important just for the kind of research i do in the future is because i immediately thought okay just because he mentions those different kinds of the, the way you can arrange things it immediately gives you more than just one way of thinking about it Right, you, you don't just go, for example, okay, now I'm, I'm going to have my two axes that are independent of each other, and now I'm going to run like a grid cell study or something like that. But you can immediately say like, that's that's one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. But you could also say, okay, let's just assume, like, what would it look like if this was not continuous two-dimensional space, but you had, for example, stereotypes, which you might want to arrange as a network or something like that. Sure. You know, how would that change the analysis? And... In a way, this is uh, nothing new, but I don't know, somehow the, just the way he presented all of that at least gave me the impression that I might do something interesting in the future. <laughs> Whether <laughs> yes. I will is an entirely different question. <laughs> but yesterday evening, for a brief, brief moment, I had hope. Yeah. So that was nice. <laughs> you had a feeling of, of importance in the future. Very good. Yeah, I mean, it will, it will all come crashing down tomorrow. But, yeah. you know, right now, yeah. it's fantastic. Actually, what what surprised me about this to to go on a little bit longer, also like about the mathematics, is like the difference in distance metrics, right? Like mm -hmm. you have like you know because he gives two examples, right? The regular Euclidean distance, right? Just um, 
feel like he should have said that earlier. I feel like at some point I was like, he's just describing Euclidean space. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> but he did yeah, mention yeah, yeah. this at the beginning. I mean, like, why is he, like, yeah, I mean, just say that at the beginning, then we can, yeah. True. But then also, like, the, the city block metrics and stuff like that, right? It's like, even that. Yeah, yeah, actually, that was it. Yeah, exactly. That was something I thought was really interesting, yeah. Because I've seen this used before in, like, some kind of paper, where, you know, where you're like, why would you do that? And they didn't really explain it. Just, oh, did, we did this. Um, and I actually, I don't think it really explains why you would do it. I think in much detail, and this is something I forgot to look up, but it's like, it's interesting, right? Because like that, it kind of shows you also to be, you know, you can be creative, right? Or like, it's not just, you know, if you're in Euclidean space, you don't need to just get these, you know, Euclidean metrics, right? Or like, you know, you can use different stuff for, 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 um, um, like distance and, and distance yeah, yeah, and yeah. stuff like that, just and, and related stuff, right? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. That's exactly like the kind of stuff that I found really interesting here. Where, where I just went like, I mean, the, the thing is also like for the stuff that some of the stuff I do, some of this stuff is kind of like inherently kind of already in there that you can have like different kinds of metrics or whatever. But it was always discussed like in this one case, you know, like if you, you know, you have options that bring you money and someone else money. Yeah, you can calculate like the joint payoff, how much both of them get together. What's the difference? Mm-hmm. That kind of stuff. But it was always described like in, in just those terms, and it seems to me seemed to me that when I kind of read this part and especially the mathematical part, that I did feel like, ah, oh, yeah, just maybe there's just many more options that maybe I haven't considered yet that will be just as interesting or new ways of formulating the stuff I already know. Yeah. Um, that you know, might lead to a dead end and not help at all, but might actually do something. Totally. I, I mean, it's, it's, and I think you did it a little bit with like the decomposed game stuff, right? It's like, I mean, you, you know, you didn't invent this, but like it's looking at stuff that's there, it exists, but like in a different, you know, like decomposing and looking at it in a different way is already like can change. I mean, the, it, right? Yeah. I mean, the, there, the interesting thing for me is just to, to generalize the whole thing, to have like a systematic way of looking at it, sure. to not just say like, Okay, so there are these things that we can do. I mean, this is yeah, a very general description, but uh, you know, it's it's not, it's not just to say like, okay, these are the things that people have done, but just to show like what the space of possibilities is in which you're moving. Okay, yeah. and to show like, yeah, you're you're not just. It's not like these are the three options you can choose between. It's more like here's the entire space of options that you can choose between, and for some reason, we've always focused on those three yeah. or whatever. Sure. And yeah. I felt like here, yeah, it was, yeah, it was actually, yeah, it's a very good analogy then that I didn't realize myself until you mentioned it, that it's kind of similar here where you go like, yeah, this is just this using metric space to calculate different differences between payoffs is one way of doing that. Yes. <laughs> there are yeah. many others. <laughs> yeah, totally. totally. And I think yeah. that just makes, well, creating theories and, and experimental predictions just so much more flexible. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess we'll see like how, how much this is actually going to change anything I do. But again, the hope is there. <laughs> From everyone, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For, yeah. So for, if you want some hope, read chapter one. <laughs> read chapter one, yeah, quit. Quit after chapter one. No, I mean, okay, so can we go on to chapter two? Yes. Um, so in a way, I like chapter two, but I feel like, you know, basically every philosopher, and this is a definite generalization, has their three levels or has their three, you know. It, 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 yeah, two is not enough and four is too many. Yeah, I, even though he mentioned, he did mention one guy who had four yeah. Um, but, um, yeah. towards the end. But yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, mister. But, <laughs> did you memorize you know, those four levels? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, this doesn't make sense. Um, and the funny thing is even he mentions kind of like everyone kind of uses the same, even the same names for it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is kind of like, yeah, guys, like, I, I, I saw this on Twitter the other time. They call it like the toothbrush theory. It's like, you don't want to use another guy's or another oh, scientist's right. Um, toothbrush, right? You want to create your own theory, give it your own name and, you know, your name usually. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was like, yeah, that makes sense because, you know, there's been a lot of three levels. Maybe we can kind of like put them together and. I'm looking yeah. forward to Kuhn's three levels. Good three levels, gonna be, yeah. I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be three and it's going to be great. It's going to be three. Yeah. Who knows? One, one chapter might uh, motivate me as much as chapter one did you. I mean, so so he talks about these three levels, the symbolic, the subconceptual and the conceptual. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's test my memory. Subconceptual is basically on the neuron level, right? 
if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I guess like he describes it in two different ways, right? The, the first is kind of the history behind it and who's kind of been doing it. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, this kind of connectionist model. And then he also, I guess... That's it, yeah. Also describes later that, yeah, I mean, you're right. He, he does kind of, I think, explain this in, initially that this was often modeled at the neuron level. But also what I found interesting afterwards is that he said, like, it's probably is actually best more like in actual physical systems. This probably like the neuron level is probably the most appropriate for this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So you have subconceptual and that's, and then you have the symbolic representation. I'm doing these two now because that's basically already exists. And he adds the conceptual level kind of, right? That's his kind of addition, yeah, exactly. his new thing. Symbolic representation is kind of highest level, almost human reasoning, I would say. Like, right? Like, how, yeah. Yeah, how would you say? It? Like, like being able to have symbols, things that have rules attached to them and you can use them and these rules to create new things or, or understand or learn stuff like that right yeah i mean I, I don't know much this is probably even though he you know introduces this conceptual level i feel like i know the conceptual level better than the symbolic one yeah it's like all the stuff he cites was always this kind of vaguely boring linguistic stuff to me <laughs> like i <didn't> never really <laughs> care like yeah whatever um but yeah you're right i mean there's yeah i think that's the kind of uh, explicitly reasoning about uh, how things relate to each other and yeah mm -hmm. using logic and rules language logic yeah you're right yeah, you're yeah, right yeah. yeah yeah and then the conceptual level that's kind of what he sa says he introduces right i, I think he, he might do, might do and that's kind of like this in between thing between these like this very low and very high level um, um mm -hmm. type of representation and he uses this jungle in the beginning, it made sense, but towards the end, I was like kind of lost in the jungle because like, it's like, it's like, yeah, how do you say that? So it's like ways of like, basically how it's very, like granularity. I think that's, that's the word he used. It's basically how zoomed yep. in you are. And yeah, then, yeah. right. That's, I mean, he that's, literally that's, says towards the end somewhere or well, not towards the end, but like in chapter two, he mentions that um, these three levels match to different levels of granularity where, yeah, the one, the, the, the sub conceptual is like. The, the the finest grained mm -hmm. level and then yeah you move up and up yeah um it kind of made sense to me though the analogy right like at yeah, first no, you go through did. the jungle and the only thing that really influences your thinking is like can i go over there can i go to dig next to you yeah yeah and you're, then you're... suddenly you have like okay like you know these paths already exist and then suddenly you and i found i actually really liked the analogy that he then i thought it also really explained very well the the symbolic level in saying like okay so first you you say like okay i can walk like along that line for that much that much but then in the symbolic level you actually just name it walk to that to tree whatever and then turn around right or whatever yeah and i thought yeah, that yeah. was a very neat way of yeah i mean I, I thought it worked but i guess he's himself says it's not it doesn't it's not perfect but i don't know i guess maybe just added that so people don't criticize him for it yeah, that's an easy way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not perfect, but and then you just <laughs> write your perfect. theory. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, what do I, oh, yeah. I, I, um, so, so in the beginning, he talks about. Uh, sorry, I'm going a little bit back now. It just, it just popped in my head. Um, in the beginning, he talks about connectionism um, and um, association, uh, associationism, association, associationism. <laughs> Jesus Christ, my my English is not a, not the best today. Um, <laughs> so he talks about these two. As in, like, those are the dominant theories now, right? And then his representation is, like, the new thing. And I feel like, like, you know, now 20 years later, 21 years later, it's almost switched. Because to me, like, yeah, his so. way of, like, rep representing, like, this Euclidean geometrical representation is kind of the thing we use right now. Like, I mean, I don't know about you, but we barely talk about connectionism. I guess connectionism is, like... Depending on, I think on... like one thing that's important to bear in mind is that, or like to to consider when when you say that, is that it really depends on the discipline. Yeah, that's probably true. Because what is deep learning, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, no, it's purely. I mean, all that right. stuff. I think. I mean, I, I, again, I'm a very much an outsider to that topic, but as far as I can tell, basically, this whole like boost in AI recently that came is in large part using the kind of deep learning, uh, the the um. Uh, connectionism with like back propagation and a few like add-ons sure. with lots of data that they now have i mean like what like one like aside here is that i remember once i kind of somewhat randomly talked to a very well established professor in ai basically yeah um i had like a 
interview for a like PhD thing and you could talk to like different professors and I talked to him and I said like oh yeah there's this yeah, like, huge boost like this was like in 2016 when I talked to him like yeah. huge boost in like deep learning that kind of stuff like you know all these like advances and he said like well not really like most of the ideas that are, yeah they're back from they're the, kind of the quite days, old yeah. it's just yeah. now we have data to test them and to do stuff with it yeah and the idea of using games as DeepMind does to test all this stuff and yeah, like some papers of his from like the 90s or early 2000s suddenly got, you know, just shot up in citations with yeah. all this stuff that came up. So I think if you're in computer science, I think sure. it's yeah. okay. very much still. There. Although I guess even though there are some, you know, I mean, DeepMind is very much collaborating with, you know, several cognitive computational neuroscientists. And there is this one paper that came out it's called something like Vector-Based Navigation that were, were a lot of... Okay. Um, deep mind people when in involved in it so i think they're also gradually adding this but okay um, okay yeah yeah i think they're probably association whatever it's called <laughs> associationism um is uh i think still very more well, especially predominant now but probably, yeah i think okay, in, i agree right. like for the stuff that we do cognitive neuroscience but then again yeah, it, it isn't but then again i think this relates to the point i mentioned very briefly earlier is that he mentions that, you know, the neurons actually are also probably the best, the most appropriate way of modeling that kind of stuff. Whereas kind of the higher you go, basically the, you know, talking again about the granularity, as you go from subconceptual to conceptual to symbolic, the higher you should go in your kind of stuff. And I think mm -hmm. it is maybe, you know, what do we do? Right, we do kind of cognitive neuroscience that has yeah, yeah, like a bit are. of reinforcement yeah. learning in it, whatever, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is kind of between... It's probably mainly conceptual with like a bit of symbolic, yeah, maybe in there or with a bit of sub-conceptual or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we just, are actually, yeah. we are pretty much firmly in this conceptual level. And you're right. Granularity. Yeah. I was just about, to, when you were talking about it, I was like, yeah, you're right. That That is actually true. Um, we are. And I think also like there is people, actually there is plenty of neuroscience on the, on the um, sub-conceptual level, you know, the, the connectome and, and that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. And if, I mean, anyone who... Maybe this is wrong, but I feel like most people who do, well, I guess he said like molecular neuroscience with like, you know, ion channels is even lower than that. But, mm. uh, you know, lots of cellular neuroscience and like the yeah, very yeah, basic exists. systems right. neuroscience is yeah. probably all of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I agree, though. I think for the stuff, I mean, this is also why I think I found chapter one so interesting because yeah. this, I think, really applies to the stuff we do. Yeah, yeah, probably. You're right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he had this section, Connections to Neuroscience, but I can't really, I have to admit, I can't really remember much from that. Yeah, it didn't have any of the neuroscience I expected. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, no, that, that might be the same for me now, yeah. But that's so. just because I thought like, oh yeah, now he's going to mention, well, I guess it was before grid cells. But uh, I mean, I think that's when he mentions like the somatotopic uh, map. Oh, you're right. Kind of yes, stuff. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, he's um, a bit more in the, yeah, you're right. It, um I guess it's like maps. many people who are from a different field, the stuff that they know about from other fields is like 20 years old. Probably, yeah. Right, because you're not like reading papers that came out yesterday, but you're looking at what the classics are, basically. And I think it's kind of the case here, too. Yeah, you're right. Um, I mean, in any ways, I mean, yeah, I, I'm still, still excited to read it. Um, I'm curious to see what's going to come, actually. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. I think, I think if I remember correctly, chapters three and four are supposed to be linked somehow. Oh, I think this is going to be like the language stuff, which I'm probably going to be super bored by. It's but, only 100 I know, it's pages. chapter five of semantics. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, there's going to be the interestingly named Voronoi tessellations. I have no idea what that is, but that's like a subchapter. In. It sounds mm -hmm. very interesting. I mean, just to, to mention on your second date, right, if you impress her with Mar, you can then go, you know, second date, Voronoi yeah, tessellations. Yeah, second date. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought you were going to mention Peter Genfers. Yeah, well, there's actually fit again first three levels, which yeah, 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 yeah. You can do that as well. And then there's this one guy who came with four. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, I think like there's, I think date three and beyond is just you're going to run out of scientific theories to talk about very quickly. Yeah, I have to think of something else to do. Anyway, I don't know. Do you have anything else to add to either dating life or this book? <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. I'm just curious to see. I mean, I'm I'm kind of I'm open um, open to what's coming. Um, and I hope, like, yeah, as I said, I, I really hope it'll kind of keep expanding my horizons and yours. No, um, I, I have the hope. Don't change anything. <laughs> Just leave me with the hope for a moment. Okay, I will. I will. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess next time we'll be talking about 
chapters three and four. Yeah. Which is a bit longer than chapters one and two, and probably a bit more technical. Oh, he's talking about colors. Anyway, so I guess, yeah. See you next time. And if you're bored in the meantime, you can listen to the interview with Jakob Elmond, uh, which talks about some of this stuff.